Lord, we thank you for your word. I release your anointing on Yannis today as he brings your word, your overcoming, liberating word. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, all the base believers. So great to see all of you. If you're visiting us this morning for the first time at the base, welcome. We've got amazing coffee, got amazing people. Trust you'll hang around to enjoy our hospitality. You know, it's amazing how God leads his church, how Jesus builds his church, how he leads his church. And uh, I'll let you share a uh, dream with me that you had last night. We haven't had a chance to talk about it yet. But it's around this reality of the nurses in hospital and the surgeons. So I'd love for her to come and just share the word. Um, I believe, or share the dream, and then I'm going to share the word with us this morning. I believe it's relevant. I believe the Holy Spirit is helping us to, to pick up what he's saying to us. So would you come, Alette? Um, I dreamed I was sitting on a theater table and Yanis was busy giving me a spinal block. But he was looking at the surgeon that was sitting next to me, not doing his job. But Yanis was very capable. So he, he did it up to a stage and then he, he was in a hurry, had to leave. And he asked the surgeon to please come and do his job. So the surgeon put the spinal block a little bit too far. And Yanis realized, oh, there's trouble. So he said to the guy, scoot move up, he got the needle back to the place it should have been, and then he went out, and I got tired, and, I, and I, I wanted to lie down, so I started leaning to the side, and, I, and this guy said to me, you can be glad you're not lying on your back, because you know that needle is still in your spine, and I got up again, and I realized, oh goodness, I can't be tired now, so I sat up, and then Yanis came in, and I was quite relieved when he walked back into this uh, surgery room. So when it comes to God invading our lives, manifesting his power, manifesting signs, wonders, miracles, speaking to us in dreams, we can get so, so hoo-ha about the manifestation instead of asking the Lord, what does it mean, isn't it? We want to know what does it mean when the Lord shows himself mighty in our midst. We want to show or understand what does the Lord mean when he speaks to us in that way. I had to learn that when God speaks things or does things, what is the meaning in that? So I remember the first time I dreamt uh, where the Lord started speaking to me in dreams, I dreamt a let was unfaithful to me. I woke up that next morning and I wanted to fight. I wanted to, just any guy that was looking at I wanted to give him two blue eyes that he couldn't see out of his own, just being honest. And then the Lord said to me, don't get so full of yourself. Just ask the meaning, get the meaning. The Lord said to me, when you dream about Alet, it's really referring to me and my bride. It's about how I feel to, about my bride. My bride is unfaithful to me. And what you're feeling, that's how I feel. But all these adulterous guys coming after the things of the world that's stealing her attention. So this morning, I believe the Lord is wanting to come and speak to his bride, speak to her in a way that the stuff that's preventing her from walking and enjoying him gets dealt with. Where your spine has been affected to stand up and enjoy God, that you can be released this morning to start to enjoy the fact that you've got an incredible groom that's preparing a feast for you, a massive wedding. Girls, I know your dream day was a big day for you, but you've got nothing compared to what is planned for you in heaven. Guys, get used to it. I think Mike said two weeks ago, get used to it, that the fact that you're a guy, you're going to have to settle the fact that you're going to be the bride of Christ for eternity. It's like, okay, don't know what to do with that. So I want to ask you to please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 10. While you do that, Kia, would you come with Kelly? Kia is ministering this week in Namibia, and uh, I'd love for us just to lay hands on them. Why do we do it? We don't need to send them, the Lord is sending them. But why do we do it in public? So that you can know that when they go, you can pray for them. 
He's going to go there to help churches preach the gospel. Uh, Kelly is not joining you this week, this time around. So Kelly is going to be at home alone. And so what a great time for us as the body of Christ to remember them, to pray for them, to trust the Lord to go before them. So would you mind just to extend your hands towards them? Father, we thank you for this couple. We thank you that they've given you their yes. And we pray, Lord, at this time in Namibia that it'll be a time of great impact, of great fruitfulness. We thank you for your protection over Kelly, over Kia. We thank you that your favor goes before them, Lord, and your presence rests on them. Bless them mightily, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys, Kia. Looking forward to the report of what's happened in Namibia. I want us to read some scriptures out of the Bible so that you can see it's in the Bible. It's not my idea. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. You need to underline this in your Bible if not. You need to underline it in your Bible till it is real in your heart. Paul is dealing with the application of the gospel. What does it mean? The fact that Jesus died, what does it mean? He says, for if by the trespass of the one man, Adam, death reigned through that one man, How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ? So Paul is writing to a community that's battling with racism. They don't understand what the Jews and the Gentile, that big division is. He's saying, guys, let me preach the gospel to you. Let me apply the meaning of the gospel to you so that you can have understanding, that you can enjoy the fullness. And then Romans 10. Let's read together from verse 1. It says, brothers, Romans 10 verse 1. It says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about, that, about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses describes it in this way. The righteousness that is by the law. He says the man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into the heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or, who will descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? It says the word is near you, it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confessed and are saved. Underline that in your Bible. When you confess that you are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Please underline that in your Bible. You are saved and you will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I've got a size 15 on this morning. I'm bringing great good news to all of you this morning. It says, but not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. 
Their voice has gone out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. And again I ask, did Israel not understand? For Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I'll make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and an obstinate people. Lord Jesus, this morning, there's an expectancy in our hearts for you to do what only you can do. Lord, there's an expectation in my heart to help your people know your ways, understand your ways, and live in your ways. And I ask this morning, Lord, that as the word goes out, that we will not just be hearers of the word, but that we will do the word. I ask this morning for your anointing. I thank you that by myself, I can do nothing. But I thank you with your anointing, Lord, with your life. Nothing is impossible for those who believe. And so we bless you and we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Give us revelation. Give us understanding. Help us to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. As I'm leading church, I'm amazed at how efficient God is. As I'm learning to walk with God, I'm, I'm amazed at how efficient God is. This morning, he's speaking to us about some corrections, getting the bride to, to walk again. As I'm standing outside waiting for Krista to give us the introduction, he says, I want to remind you of God's ways. God's ways are so much higher than your ways. Have you discovered that about God? His thoughts are so much higher than your thoughts. And when I started reading the Bible, I thought, oh my goodness, if his ways are that high, if his thoughts are that high, high how the heck am I going to know his ways or his thoughts? But God expects us. He expects us to know his ways. He expects us to know his thoughts. His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. But when we start to access his ways, access his thoughts, we can start to enjoy everything that God has for us. And so as preachers, we need to help God's people discover God's ways, discover his thoughts. And what you're going to learn about God's ways, not only is his ways higher and his thoughts higher, but when you start to partner with God and start to work in God's ways, you get incredible blessing, you get incredible life, you get incredible purpose, you get everything that God has, you start to enjoy. You excited about that? Keen for that? So this morning I want to talk to you about working in the ways of God, working with the words of God. How do you work with God's word? How do you work in the ways of God and how God uses words? And that word I want to, I want to limit to the word about Christ. Because if, if you can get to understand God's ways and know how to work with God's ways and know how to work with this word of Christ, then your life is going to look radically different this morning. Not only this morning, not only starting this morning, for eternity, your life is going to look different. So Paul says, guys, do you know that the grace of God has enabled you? There's so much grace. It's an abundant provision. God's never going to run out on grace. I'm so grateful. Even when I make a mistake, he says, I've, luckily I've provided more than enough grace for you. Just find my way again. Just get, get back on the highway again. And so how do we work? How do we work with a word about Christ? Well, firstly, we need to start off accepting the word about Christ. We need to start off accepting. What is it about Christ that we need to hear? What is it we need to accept? If we're going to partner with God and know God's ways, we need to accept the word that is spoken about Christ. Now listen to how it says this in verse 16. What does it look like when you accept the word about Christ? Verse 16 says, not all the Israelites accepted the good news for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So what does it look like when you, 
when you accept the word about Christ. You need to hear about what Christ has done for you. You cannot accept something that you haven't heard. Why are you giving money to the church? You enable us to, to send preachers out to work with God, to go and help others understand, oh, this is the way God works. How do you accept the word about Christ? Someone has to tell you about what Christ has done for you. Someone has to go out into the deep, dark recesses of our world and go and tell people about what Christ has done. He says, how beautiful are those feet? Do you know that the Lord is wanting to use your feet to make your feet beautiful? Now, I know some of you have got ingrown toenails. Some of you don't have toenails anymore. And you're like, oh, I don't know how beautiful they can be. But get what the Lord is saying. He's not concerned about the physicality of what your size or your feet or your toes look like. He's saying, would you start to walk in my ways of going out there and telling people about my ways, my thoughts for them. And if you tell them about the word of Christ, if you tell them about Christ and they accept him, oh my goodness, everything is about to change. How do you know that you've accepted the word about Christ? How do you know this morning whether you've accepted that word? I mean, most of you looking at you this morning, it looks like you've accepted that word, but I don't want to take it for granted. I don't want to assume it. How do you know that you've accepted the word that you've heard about Christ? Paul says it's very simple. You start to call on the name of the Lord. You start to call on him. Genesis chapter 4, the first time people start calling on the name of the Lord. They say, oh Lord, would you save us? Oh Lord, would you save us? Now that we realize your ways are so much higher, oh Jesus, would you save us? We start to call on the name of the Lord. What does it look like? It looks like this. You raise both your hands and you start to call the name of Jesus. Oh Jesus, I call on your name. Thank you that you save me. Thank you that you heal me. Thank you that you deliver me. Thank you that I can partner with God because of you. When last did you call on the Lord? When last did you take your quiet time and made it a loud time with the Lord? I was just me and Jesus, you know, we, Lord, I just don't want to, I, don't, I want to just honor you, Lord. I just want to know you, know, Lord. It's just between me and you, Lord. I trust you'll hear me, Lord. Paul says, no, that's not, that's not how you accept the word about Christ. How do you accept it? You start to call on the name of the Lord. So Jesus, save me. Jesus, redeem me. Jesus, help me. I call on your name. I arrest heaven. They must hear me. They must impact me. He must touch me right now. Wow, how the presence of the Lord rests on that call. Do you feel how the atmosphere shifted? And I was the only one calling. Imagine what will happen if everyone in this meeting starts to call on the name of the Lord. It says you're calling on the master of everything. That's what that word Lord means. You're calling on the master, the one that owns everything. You're calling on his name. Do you think if you call on his name when you face poverty, he will answer? He owns everything. Call on the name of the owner. He'll help you. Imagine you break down in your car and you find the nearest house. You knock on the door and there's the little boy that comes to open the door. It's like, boy, can you help me? I said, I, I, my dad, I'm not sure. My, let me go fetch my dad. He's the owner. He'll know what to do with your car, sir. Paul says, call on the master, call on the one that owns everything. The cattle on a thousand hill is his. Everything belongs to him. What can you, what can you expect to enjoy when you start to call on the, the name of the Lord? Verse 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What is he talking about? He's talking about the 
the eternal destination that will happen to your life when you start to call on the name of the Lord. Do you know that when you call on the name of the Lord, you start to enjoy the eternal benefits of His life? The word there to be saved is the word sozo. You'll get the sozo of God. What is it? It's not so-so. It's the sozo of God. What is that? You get the life of God. My goodness. You mean if I call on the master's name, he'll share his life with me? It's exactly what Paul is saying. Can I tell you about the life of God? The life of God is a penalty paying life. He paid for your penalty of sin so that you don't have to end in hell. If you don't call on the name of the Lord, I've got good news for you, sir, bad news for some, you are going to end up in hell. Now you decide whether you want to call on his name or just call on religion. It's your choice. You decide whether you want to call his name or call on rules or tradition. But unless you call on his name, your destination is secure, you're going to end up in hell. That's what makes the gospel good news. That's what's calling on his name. That's what makes it good news. You call on his name, the master says, I'll share my penalty paying life with you. Heaven is your destination. Yes, but it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't look like it. I know. Sometimes, most often, it doesn't look like you're going to go to heaven. But because you called on the name of the Lord and he's faithful, he says, because of what Christ has done, I'll share my penalty paying life with you. The sozo life of God. The sozo life of God is the authority breaking life of God. The moment you participate in his life, all the illegal authorities that's in your life get dealt with. The sozo life of God is an atmosphere changing life. When you walk into a room, you change the atmosphere because you carry the life of God inside of you. Is there any atmosphere changes here this morning? There's about 20. When you call on the name of the Lord, he shares his eternal life with you. Do you know that you will never die? For eternity, you're going to live in his presence. For eternity, you're going to behold his glory with your two eyes. You're going to see him. You're going to behold him. You're going to be amazed at him. I mean, if you don't want to call on the name of the Lord after that, then I don't know. God says, come participate in my ways. Learn how I work with the word. Start to call on the name of the Lord. He will save you from final destruction. When this world goes shaking and stuff is falling to pieces, God says, oh, that's my boy. That's my girl. Come, come, come. COVID, World War Three. Apocalypse, fast my broek, my bus is bang Death, you can't faze me. I call on the name of the Lord. He's the master. You see, when you start to work with a word about Christ, you are saying, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my master. I do not even belong to myself anymore. I'm a bond servant. I'm a slave. He has, he has put his finger, I'm, I carry his earring. I belong to him. He's my master. He decides. He decides. What he says, I do. What he wants, I give. He's my master. He's my Lord. I tell you, friends, when the church starts to realize the power of calling on the master, on the Lord as your master, you don't have options anymore. Jesus takes a lot of options away for you. How do we work with the word? Paul says not only do you need to accept the word about Christ, but you're going to have to locate the word about Christ. You need to find out where is Christ in this. Love how he's doing it. 
He says, if you're going to locate the word about Christ, you're going to have to know where this word is. Where is Christ? He says, for some, Christ is in heaven. He's so high up there. It's like, how are we going to get there to receive this word? He says, for others, Christ, for you, he's still dead. He's still in the grave. You still think you're Jesus. Interesting story about a guy. Doesn't make a lot of sense. A lot of factual history. But I I think he's still in the grave. Paul says, no, no, you need to learn to locate. If you're going to work with God's word about Christ, you're going to have to locate. You're going to have to learn to locate that word. Surprise, surprise. Where does he say that word is? Where does he say that word should be? In your heart and on your lips. You you mean to bring Jesus down from heaven? No, 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 no. You mean to call Jesus out of the dead? No, 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 no. He's done all that. The gospel said he became a man, he suffered, he died, he was raised out of death, and he ascended to the heavens. Why? So that God can now live inside of you. Locate him. What does it mean to be right with God? What does it mean to be righteous? It means you've located God. He's living after your calling on his name. He's moved in. You're his home now. You? Doesn't make sense. I know God's ways are higher, isn't it? Yes, see, that's a stretching thought. I know God's thoughts are higher, isn't it? You mean to tell me, Yannis, that when I locate Jesus Christ, the one living inside of me by his spirit, when I realize he's connected with my spirit, he's living inside of you, when I locate him in my heart, I believe with my heart and confess with my mouth that things look different. Oh, absolutely. The problem with religion is they're looking for God out there somewhere. They're still searching. They haven't located Christ yet. Now, let's go slowly here because I can see I'm changing gears here. There's cogs turning very slowly in some instances. Jesus is a man. If we're going to locate Christ, we need to know what Christ means. It's not his surname. Jesus Christ is not his surname. It's not like Janus Labiskachni. Jesus Christ is not the surname of Jesus. Jesus was a man. As a man, he's seated in the heavenlies right now. What a thought. What a thought. He shares humanity in heaven. He knows what it feels like to have a body. Jesus the man, God in a man's suit, is seated in heaven right now. But Christ, the anointed one, the anointing, You need to locate him. He's not just in heaven. He's sharing his anointing with you, inside of you. Anointed, the spirit of God inside of you. You can also walk like an anointed man, an anointed woman of God. Do I need to say that again? You also can do the things that Jesus did. How? Because he's living inside of you now. John chapter 14, Jesus says, guys, they say, Lord, just show us the Father. Just if you show us the Father, we'll be so happy. It's like, yeah, then, then at least what you come to do will make sense for us. Jesus says, guys, let me help you. Have you not seen the Father by looking at me? Have you not discovered that God lives inside of me? The Father lives inside of me. He's working inside of me. If you don't believe the words, then look at the works I've done. You know what the world is screaming to the church? They're saying, please just show us Jesus. You know what the church's response should be? It's like, how can you be asking that? Just have a look at me. He's living inside of me. He's working inside of me. He's the source of my life. If you don't believe the words I'm saying, let's look at the works I'm doing. 
Do you know when you locate Christ, when you locate the fact that he lives inside of you, you can do what Jesus did and you can say what Jesus said. See, when you locate Christ, when you locate him, he's not just seated in heaven. He's not in the grave anymore. He's alive, he's well, and he's sharing his anointing with you. He's sharing his anointing with his body. He's living inside of you. He's working inside of you. Those dreams you've been getting, maybe at some point start to believe it's the Lord speaking to you. You see, when you start to locate Christ living inside of you by His Spirit, you activate the internal realities of God. What does it mean? What does it look like to have God inside of you? It looks like peace. It sounds like joy. I think two weeks ago, I stretched some of you with my laughter by faith. Some of you subsequently, two weeks later, it still looks like you're baptized in vinegar. You know why? You know why you're still sad? You know why you're still feeling pressure? It's because you haven't located Christ yet. You haven't located the fact that he's the source of your life. He died for you, but he also died as you. He died for your sin, and you died to self with him. Now, if you dare to sin and dare to self, how the heck are you live? How, how the heck do you live? You live through his life, his source. He's the source of your life. We look at 1 Corinthians 12 in maybe a couple of weeks. What can you expect when God is the source of your life? You can expect all sorts of spirit manifestations. Revelation. Wow, I never knew that. Power, yo. Yeah. No, that's possible. Inspiration. Why? Because you've located Christ. He lives inside of you by His Spirit. And when you locate Him, you activate the peace of Christ inside of you. When you locate Him, you activate the joy of Christ inside of you. How? By faith. Have I got any evidence that you're going to be joyful in a minute? The moment, the evidence is overwhelmingly no. <laughs> like, yes, Lord, how are we going to move them this morning? But for those of you this morning who can by faith work with the word about Christ, knowing that he's living inside of you, if you can start to receive that by faith, Never mind the peace that will come on you, the joy that will get out of you. Can we locate him by faith? Jesus. There you go. There you go. Oh, my Lord. What's happening? God is busy touching me. He's punching me in my stomach saying, I'm here. I want to touch my people if they can just receive and locate me by faith. I'll heal their bodies right now. I'll bring joy to their lives. I'll bring peace into their hearts. Yes, how's that possible? That's just possible by faith because God's ways are so much higher. His thoughts are so much higher. I just need to sort of look like I'm agreeing with him. I'll get the benefit. Amen. <laughs> Receive it. <laughs> Don't be happy for him. Be happy for yourself. <laughs> it's like, yes, someone got it, but I also need it. <laughs> just close your eyes if you don't mind. Just close your eyes. Put your Bible aside just for a little bit. Locate him. He's in the heavens as a man, but he's living inside of you by his spirit. Oh, Jesus, you're awesome. We bless what you're doing this morning, Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus, we bless what you're doing this morning. He's not dead anymore. He's defeated death, sir. If you can locate him by faith, he'll put peace on you. 
Whoa, Jesus. For some, to get the peace, you're going to have to, by faith, forgive some of those people that's hurt you. Just forgive them. There you are. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. <laughs> wow. I tell you, as I'm standing here, I'm getting so warm. Who's sensing heat on their bodies right now? That's the love of God. That's you by faith receiving the fact that God is my source. And he's saying, wonderful, here's my love. I love you passionately. Okay, let's open our eyes. Just wave at me if you sense the presence of God on your body right now. Have a look around. Welcome to the base. What have you done? Did you fast for this moment? Did you tithe for this moment? Come now, church. You just sort of agreed with Jesus. You located him. All of a sudden, the presence of the Lord is on your body. How powerful is that? Some of us are reading our Bibles, trying to locate Jesus in the Bible. That's helpful. If you keep searching, you're going to find out, oh my goodness, he lives inside of me by his spirit. <laughs> wow. Wow. His word is true. Am I helping some of us this morning? If we're going to work with God's word about Christ, we spoke about accepting him. We spoke about locating him. If you want to get the, the now benefits, this next one is huge. Who of you would love to get healed this morning? Who of you would like to get delivered this morning from depression and hopelessness? Thank you, sir. Who of you would like to be blessed, to be prosperous? There's... About 30, it's getting more. <laughs> Who of you would love to have, stop having these miscarriages and actually start producing children? No, raise your hand. But when you understand what it looks like to confess Christ, what I'm going to deal with you right now, you're going to start to enjoy the immediate benefits of God right now in this moment, in this meeting. Some of you are like, okay. Get over so that we can go home. Verse eight. Says that when we get this word of Christ, we need to proclaim it. It says, the word is, what does it say? Verse 8 says, the word is near you, it's in your mouth, and it's in your heart. This is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confessed and are saved. Did you get the difference? Verse 13 says you will be saved. It speaks about one day when you get to die or you get to heaven. You will be saved. Verse 10 says when you proclaim Christ and you confess his name, his covenantal name to your circumstance, to your enemies, to your obsession, to your opposition. When will you be saved? There's three of you that says it'll be now. The bikers are helping us to make the point. When you accept Christ, you will be saved one day. You'll make it to heaven because Jesus performed on your behalf. And you just sort of agreed, say, Lord, I want that. But when you proclaim him, 
to your circumstance, to your environment, to the disease, to the poverty, when you proclaim his name, when you confess that Jesus is not just the master, he's the covenant-making God. God the Father made a covenant with God the Son saying, my son, if you go do this, whoever agrees with what you've done and proclaim it to their circumstance, proclaim it to their body, proclaim it to their finances, in that moment I will save them. In that moment I will heal them. In that moment I will deliver them. In that moment, I'll give them wisdom to deal with their finances to unlock prosperity. Paul says, you are saved. He's not talking about the so-so life. He's not talking about the so-so. That's future tense. He's talking about the now, the soteria, the healing, the deliverance, the prosperity, the blessing of God right now in this moment. How do you work with that word? You must proclaim it. You must confess it. You must be so convinced in your heart that whatever circumstance is coming against your way, you saying, circumstance, I've got a conviction that Jesus has made a covenant with my heavenly Father to overthrow you. In that moment, right now, you get delivered. You. In that moment, right now, you get healed. Yo, the fire of the Lord is starting to work now. Yes, Jesus. Just receive. When are you saved if you proclaim and confess the name of Christ? There's one that says now. Let me ask you a little bit wider to the second row, third row. If you confess, if you proclaim the name of Christ, the covenant name of Christ, when do you receive the benefit? Okay, let me go 10 rows in. When do you receive the benefit, man? When does he do it? Okay. When does it show in the world? When does it manifest in the world? Because that's a big question. Sometimes it's not now. That's the issue with faith, isn't it? I told you about my friend's mother that had a broken kneecap. She was listening to the television evangelist backsliding in a room, not coming to church. He says, I believe the Lord is healing a kneecap right now. She says, oh, that's me, that's me. She got up. When did the Lord heal her? In that moment. When did it show? Three months later. The ways of God. Oh, yes, I understand the like I promise you sometimes I don't either. But by faith. So she receives the word, Jesus is healing me now. She gets up and for three months she walks with a broken kneecap. After three months, the healing that the Lord did three months ago manifested in the reality of time. And she started walking. Her children's like, oh mom, God healed you. Wow, we need to celebrate this moment. He says, no, no, no. We need to celebrate three months ago. That's why I received it. Does it mess with your mind? It does. God's ways and thoughts are so much higher. What did she do for three months? After receiving the now healing of God. She says, oh, I hope he's going to heal me someday. You know, I know he's done it in the Bible. I think he'll do it again someday. Is that how she walked? No. <laughs> She went like this. Oh, thank you, he's healed me. I call on the name of the Lord. Broken leg, I'm telling you, Jesus had made a covenant with the Father and I'm healed already. Oh, welcome to fruitcake territory (laughs) in the eyes of the world.
Is there any fruitcakes amongst us this morning? There's about 30. The rest of you, welcome to the bus. We're going to introduce you to faith and the world's going to say, yes, I love fruitcakes, die. When you confess Christ, when you proclaim him, you get the covenantal benefits. You get what happens in Genesis chapter 2 when the great I am creates everything for Adam. You get the covenantal God saying, I'm going to creatively provide for you. I'm going to faithfully pursue you. We've made a covenantal friendship. I will heal you, I will deliver you, I will save you, I will bless you. And interesting in Deuteronomy chapter 7, he'll bless the fruit of your womb so that you don't miscarry. I feel this morning the Lord is wanting to restore hope to ladies that has got miscarriages and like, ah, where's Jesus? Paul says to the, the province of Galatia, the churches, he says, who's bewitched you? How, did you, how, did, how did you land up in the place where you think it's by effort that you're going to unlock God's ways? He says, it's not. It's by faith. In the spirit. It's not through effort. You see, working the way God works, working with the words about Christ, we work with him by faith. It means you call on him, you locate him, and you confess him to your circumstance. You confess him to your family. You confess him to all the obstacles in your life. You don't go quiet. Is there anyone here this morning that have never accepted Jesus? I'd love for you to raise your hand real quick. You've never accepted the word about Christ, what God says about Christ. So turn to your neighbor and say, hey, I'm going to see you in heaven. And immediately, immediately there's a lot of life. <laughs> I didn't know you could get so excited. I didn't know that you can get so excited. It's amazing what happens when you think about that idea. Immediately there's fellowship. Hey, I can't stop talking. I'm going to make it to heaven. Well, that's what it should look like on the earth. That's what church should be about. I'm going to heaven. Can I tell you about it? And can we fellowship about it? <laughs> and so friends, while it's nice and I'm so grateful, I'm saddened that we're not inviting those to hear the gospel preached. Or, let me go one above. I believe you've brought your neighbor and told him about Jesus already. Just say, just let, let's follow me to this church. Let me go help you with faith. I trust that's what's happening. That's why there's no one get, being born again this morning. If not, invite them. Invite them. Let them hear the good news so that they can call on the name of the Lord themselves. Willie? Really? I wonder if you could stand with me. So we've established that God lives inside of us by His Spirit. Christ lives inside of us by His Spirit. We've established that. For some, 
You're learning to locate him again. Can we do that together this morning? Would you be comfortable in raising your hands with me so that we can locate Christ, the one who lives inside of us? Some of you are getting free as you just did that simple action. Now, would you mind to start confessing his name? Just start to proclaim his name. Just start to say, Jesus is the Lord. He's the covenant God. He's my Lord. He's promised to care for me. He's promised to heal me. He's promised to deliver me. Oh, Jesus. There you are, just receive. You've made a proclamation. You've made a proclamation. Speak to your finances. Proclaim the covenantal provision of the Lord to your finances. He wants to bless you this morning. Receive it. Just receive it. Bless you, Lord. Bless you. Hey, Jesus. I just want to ask the band to lead us. But I want you to use this moment not just as an internal moment, but to make it a, a declaration moment, to make it a proclamation moment. Let's praise Jesus this morning. As you proclaim Him as Lord over your life, allow Him to heal, allow Him to deliver, allow Him to set you free. Right now, thank you, Lord. If there's any ladies here this morning that is battling with, with your womb, you've had many miscarriages this morning, I'd love to lay hands on you with a let. Just so that the Lord will bless your womb and you can be released into fruitfulness. I'm sure there's many words that the elders, leaders in front will have. But if that's you this morning, would you come? Lord, this morning with the authority that's in your word, I declare over your bride that she will not be lame anymore. She will not be paralyzed anymore. The spinal block this morning has removed. That she can stand up. That she can walk in your ways. That she can walk in righteousness. That she can walk in radiance and purity. That she can walk, Lord. Let's worship him, friends. Let's worship Jesus. He's so awesome. Let's proclaim his name this morning.